For more on the executive pay debate, let's bring in John Coffey. He's professor of securities law at Columbia University. He joins us now from here in New York. Professor Coffey, welcome to Bloomberg News. My pleasure. Professor, uh, two people familiar with the matter telling Bloomberg that executives at seven bailed out companies, including Citigroup and Bank of America, will have their pay cut by an average of 50 percent after negotiations with Mr. Feinberg. Was wondering if I might get your thoughts on that. Well, this is probably more draconian than I expected. But looking beneath the surface, this is really not a restriction on overall pay for most of those seven firms. It is instead a restriction on the cash component. There can be very high restricted stock bonuses given to these employees to compensate for the reduced cash. And that is the real goal here, to move executives from a cash compensated short-term perspective to a longer-term perspective under which they will receive restricted stock that probably can't be exercised until many years later. Well, people, sir, have, have suggested that uh, these extraordinary uh, times call for extraordinary measures, but at what point does the reach of the government and government intervention become just too much. Remember, this has only been done to seven firms. Those seven firms all failed. And the real message here from the government's perspective is that if you are an executive of a too big to fail financial institution and you do fail and get a taxpayer bailout, you are going to pay for it because your compensation will be at risk. And I think this template will be followed if we ever have any more too big to fail examples. Professor, do you think that this will be effective? Obviously, the goal here, as you said, is to have these executives focus more on the long term, not take on so okay. much risk. Is it now, going to be enough? Let's, let's focus on what's likely to happen. Those who stay with their firm and receive restricted stock will have very different incentives. They will become team players rather than potential free agents. Because once you have a year or two of restricted stock, it's just too costly to move. You have, you're going to be forfeiting dozens and dozens of millions of dollars in stock option uh, benefits. However, in the short term, a number of people will move. And at AIG, where the ceiling is particularly low, where it really is a total of 200,000, I expect there will be a lot of departures, and I think the government accepts that. The government knows that those people have prior executive compensation that they're unwilling to change, and so they're offsetting that by saying almost no salary at all for the future until we get some kind of further agreement on whether you will curb your existing contractual executive compensation arrangements. Where do you think those folks are going to end up? Who's going to be the beneficiary of that talent you know, that's leaving AIG? Many will leave, but not everyone who's promising to leave, because not all these people are universally regarded as stars. Everyone considers himself a star, but that's self-grading. The rest of the market may not view all of these AIG employees who managed to lose $180 billion as quite as valuable as they viewed themselves. So some will leave, and they will probably go to trading firms, particularly to firms like hedge funds, because even the Federal Reserve has limited jurisdiction. They can impose similar rules over banks, but they have no control over either insurance companies or hedge funds until Congress gives them that authority, if Congress does. Uh, professor, ab ab about Kenneth Feinberg, tell us about the type of job that he had. Uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner, as we said, praising Feinberg, saying that he did a commendable job uh, dealing with companies that received, again, quoting, exceptional assistance from the government. Well, again, I think his job was to negotiate, and Ken Feinberg is one of the best negotiators in the world. Mm. He's done this in the world of mass torts and class actions and 9-11. So he's had a lot of experience in difficult, painful negotiations. Here, I think he got something that was more or less similar from six of the seven, and they more or less got the same standards. AIG resisted and would not reduce their existing contractual executive compensation, and so he hit them over the head with a two-by-four right. and telling them their perspective compensation has an absolute $200,000 limit. But that's a response to their own intransigence. Professor John Coffey of Columbia University joining us this afternoon. Okay. Professor, thanks for your perspective. Sure.